letting people in, okay? Okay. And if Carl wants to let people in too, that'd be great. You go ahead and start. Uh, after we get rolling, then I'll, I'll watch that. Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to our UW-Madison Division of Extension Industrial Hemp Field Day update. Uh, we are working right now to get all of the participants into the meeting. So we'll just uh, work on that here for a few minutes. We are also live streaming this on YouTube if you are unable to connect via Zoom. We ask that during our meeting, you leave your cameras off and stay muted. If you have questions, please put them into the chat box and we will answer those as we get done with the presentations today. Right now you should be seeing the welcome screen. This is a agenda of how we are going to go through our virtual hemp field day today and um, starting now and then hoping to be wrapping this up by one o'clock, depending on the number of questions. We would like to thank all of our um, presenters that will be presenting today. Um, this slide is just all of us through UW that are active participants in our hemp research that we are doing at Madison. So take a moment to look over this slide and those that have helped with the hemp research this year. Hi, I'm Shelby Ellison. I am a assistant professor in the Department of Horticulture at UW-Madison. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the hemp research and extension efforts that we're doing here. So why are we focusing on hemp now in 2020? Well, as of 2014 with the Farm Bill, it was once again legal to start doing hemp pilot research programs across the country. It wasn't until 2018 that we were able to legally grow hemp in Wisconsin. This is our, our third year that we're able to start gathering data and collecting information on hemp in the state of Wisconsin. So we have several different counties involved. Right now we're up in Buffalo County and this is one of our research trials behind me that we're running. A little bit more about hemp in Wisconsin. So interestingly, Wisconsin was the leader in hemp production back in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. That hemp that was grown at the time was for fiber production. A lot of that went towards the war effort for using hemp to, for rope production or for the Navy fleet, for things like sails, canvas. And Wisconsin was 
along with Kentucky, the leader in the country for that hemp production. And actually, you'll still see a lot of feral hemp left over from that effort throughout the Midwest and a lot of it in Wisconsin still. So now with the re-legalization of hemp in the country and in Wisconsin, that is, is not the type of hemp that's being grown very much. So there's a significant effort to grow hemp for cannabinoid or essential oils. So one of the most common cannabinoids that hemp is grown for now is called CBD or cannabidiol. So behind me, this trial, there are six different cultivars that have high concentrations of either cannabidiol, which is CBD, or CBG. And that is probably predominantly across the country what people are growing right now is hemp for CBD or CBG production, probably at least 90% of the hemp being grown. There are two other reasons people grow hemp, that is for seed or for grain production. So when you grow for grain production, you have both males and female hemp plants in the field. The males pollinate the females and then you get grain production. So only the females with that grain is harvested. There's lots of different grain products that people use. You might have seen hemp hearts or hulled hemp seed in the grocery store. You can also extract oil from the grain. And there's things like hemp protein powder. Interestingly, it's not legal right now. Feed hemp grain to animals. But there are several studies that are happening across the state looking at if if it's good to feed hemp grain to animals and how much of those uh, various cannabinoids get transferred into the, if you know, if you're looking at cattle, into the milk or meat. So those studies are underway. A lot of farmers are eager to find out if they'll be able to feed grain to cattle. And then the third use of hemp is the, the kind of the traditional use, which is for fiber production. And so that's using the stalk of the plant. Hemp fiber is one of the strongest fibers out of all plants in the whole world. It has very long, very strong fibers. And with that fiber production, you can make many different products. So traditionally, things like rope, that people think of, but there's lots of other uses now for biocomposites. Hempcrete is a building material. There's lots of different emerging technologies that people are using to try to to bring hemp, oh, hemp paper, which would obviously be something that would be interesting in the state of Wisconsin with all of our paper mills that we have here. So, so the three main uses being the, the essential oils, so CBD being the primary one, hemp grain, and hemp fiber. So that was just um, an, a brief update into what we're working here on at Madison and talking about. There are a few videos and there we still have a lot of people joining us today. So if you are having a little bit of trouble hearing some of the videos, uh, please adjust your volume on your end uh, as, as we listen through these. So we are going to get into our industrial hemp grain and fiber updates. And our first um, video and first speaker today is Jerry Clark. Madison, uh, stationed in Chippewa County. We've done industrial hemp research the last two years, industrial hemp related to seed and fiber production. Seed and fiber production varies much differently than what we've seen with CBD production. And for seed and fiber production, we typically can use more mechanical type of planting, like for instance, a grain drill. And then for harvest, we can actually use a combine. So a lot of the equipment that farmers currently have is, is available to get into industrial hemp related to grain and, and fiber production. What we would see with grain and fiber production for industrial hemp, we have male and female flowers both planted. So we want that pollination to occur and have that seed production available. And so what we've been researching here the last two years have been some of the agronomic types of conditions related to seeding rates, varieties, as well as nitrogen application. And with those types of uh, agronomic uh, studies that we've been doing, we've been discovering that industrial hemp is related very closely to fertilizing similar to corn. You want your pH levels to be more similar to alfalfa. So from those standpoints, you're looking at your soil conditions. That would be the fertility we, we would look at. Uh, typically is a warmer season crop, so we look at planting into June, definitely after soybeans. So we'd like to see that planting date be pushed back into June when we know those soils are much warmer. Seems like we get better germination 
and get some of those early weed control problems. Currently, there aren't a lot of options available for weed control in industrial hemp. So therefore, we'd like to see pre burn down treatment or if you're growing organic, be able to do something where you can keep that weed control down. In terms of harvest side of things, again, we can use a years have been some of the agronomic types of conditions related to seeding rates, varieties, as well as nitrogen application. And with those types of uh, agronomic uh, studies that we've been doing, we've been discovering that industrial hemp is related very closely to fertilizing similar to corn. You want your pH levels to be more similar to alfalfa. So from those standpoints, you're looking at your soil conditions. That would be the fertility we, we would look at. Uh, typically is a warmer season crop, so we look at planting into June, definitely after soybeans. So we'd like to see that planting date be pushed back into June when we know those soils are much warmer. Seems like we get better germination and get some of those early weed control problems. Currently, there aren't a lot of options available for weed control in industrial hemp. So therefore, we'd like to see pre burn down treatment or if you're growing organic, be able to do something where you can keep that weed control down. In terms of harvest side of things. Again, we can use a I apologize. The video uh, keeps playing here and, and we've, we've seen that a couple of, of technical difficulties. Growing organic, be able to do something if where you can keep that can weed still... control down. In terms of harvest side of things, again, we can use a in Madison uh, station. All right, next, as we stop the video and it wanted to keep playing, um, as we're moving through our grain and fiber update, um, our next speaker today is Haley Ortmeyer Clark, and she's a graduate research assistant uh, in the Department of Agron Agronomy with Division of Extension and UW Madison. So we are going to hear from Haley. We have a video, and then she's going to be speaking. And then after that, we will take questions uh, for both Haley or Jerry, if there are any. Hello, my name is Haley Ortmeyer Clark, and I'm a second year master's student here at UW Madison working with industrial hemp. Unlike most of the other crops that we grow here in Wisconsin, with industrial hemp, we don't have well defined management guidelines and practices for growers. So all of the work that we're doing here is helping us to better understand how industrial hemp grows as a crop here in Wisconsin and how we can better help the growers trying to produce it. The field that I'm standing in here is where we're looking at different agronomic practices like planting density and nutrient management programs to see how they impact final grain and fiber yield as well as things like weed suppression and other plant characteristics. So what we're doing is we have two different varieties, X59 and CRS1, and we planted those at three different planting densities of 20, 30, and 40 pounds of seed per acre. On top of that, we have three different nutrient management programs of no additional applied nitrogen, and then 60 and 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. We're really looking forward to seeing what we find out with this year because it is a replication of this study. This is year two. And we had very different growing conditions between last year and this year. We were able to get planted earlier than last year, and then it was a lot drier this year. So the environments that these plants are growing in have been very different. On top of this trial, we're doing a variety trial where we're evaluating 15 varieties from all over the world to see how those varieties grow here in Wisconsin. Aside from growing that variety trial during the regular growing season, we're also establishing it after winter wheat harvest at the end of July and early August to see if hemp could be a viable double crop option. The last part of my program is looking at herbicide tolerance in hemp. Um, I screened around 44 herbicides that we commonly use here in corn and soybeans um, and applied those to hemp to see what are some of the possible symptomologies that we could see for herbicide injury, as well as are there any viable options that we could use for chemical management of weeds in industrial hemp. So all of this information, like I said, is just really helping us develop ways to help growers um, across the state of Wisconsin in their Uh, 
um, ventures to grow industrial hemp here in the state. Hello, my name is Haley. All right, um, so as Ashley said, my name is Haley and I work with Dr. Rodrigo Worley and Sean Conley here at UW-Madison working with grain and fiber um, hemp varieties. So I'm going to briefly look through some hemp physiology, some of the challenges that we face when growing hemp, um, and then touch a little bit on our results that we saw last year. So to start, um, hemp is a naturally dioecious um, plant. That means that there are both male and female flowers, and they're typically on different plants. Um, there are some monoecious varieties where they have both male and female flowers on the same plant, um, but for the most part, we see um, the two different types of plants. The hemp leaves, which we'll see if it will change, are, are pretty characteristic. We see the, the serrated edges, um, they're palmate, so they have the different leaflets. We typically see about seven to nine leaflets in, in our varieties. Um, and that's pretty recognizable. When people think of hemp, they tend to be able to picture um, the hemp leaves. Looking at the flowers, um, this is one of the most important distinctions that you need to be able to make when growing hemp, um, is being able to tell between the male plants and the female plants. Again, when you're growing um, for the grain, you need both um, in order for that pollination to occur and have the grain development. So on the left side of the screen, we see the male flowers. They're a lot um, more loose um, and tend to dangle down at the top of that plant versus where we see on the right, which is the female flower. Uh, we can see it's clustered at the very top. Um, it's not really spread out on the top of the plant and they do tend to also grow in the nodes um, where leaves attach at the top of the plant. Um, and a characteristic is that if you look in the diagram there, the white stigma um, kind of emerge from that flower and that is what accepts the pollen. So if you are growing for grain and fiber, you need to make sure that you're communicating with your neighbors if they're growing for um, CBD where they don't want that pollination to occur, making sure um, that there's not that cross pollination with um, the two different types of, of hemp. Next, to touch on some challenges, um, it really starts with, with when you're planting. So our target planting date is much later than common crops like corn and soybeans. Um, we target to the very end of May, early June um, to try and get it planted. And that means that early emerging weeds are able to establish and get going before you even plant your hemp. So you need to make sure that your seedbed is um, kind of the best environment you can give for your hemp whether that is some final tillage right before you plant or a burned down herbicide, um, if that is something that you use just to make sure that you take care of all of those weeds that are early established. Which then leads into the issue of weed management. So there are no chemical control options for hemp right now. There are no registered herbicides for use in hemp in the United States. So without that option, you have your seedbed preparation and then you also have mechanical cultivation. But there are also some challenges with that um, because hemp is planted at a relatively shallow planting depth of about a half inch. And so when you're doing mechanical cultivation, you have to be careful that you're not being too rough and actually uprooting that hemp. So the top picture here is after one pass of a tine weeder. Um, this was at the recommended growth stage of about two true leaves on the hemp. And the hemp itself was almost completely uprooted. But as we can see in the bottom picture, that grass seedling is actually still fully intact and not damaged. So if there was a rain right after this, it would have the chance to kind of reroot um, and continue growing. Another issue with mechanical cultivation is that you um, are kind of limited depending on what row spacing you're using. Um, here are just a few pictures. Looking at the picture on the left here is a plot that was in the middle of pollination. It should have been thriving um, and this plot was almost completely overtaken by weeds. That was a no-till system. Um, so we didn't have the opportunity to really give the hemp a good start. But even with tillage um, or mechanical cultivation through these last two pictures, we can see that between those rows, um, weeds still did occur. Um, 
Lastly, we have the weather challenges, which is something we face when trying to grow anything. Um, but we saw very different growing conditions between last year and this year. So with precipitation, if you have a lot of excess water, um, like we did last year where it was really hot and humid and wet, we did see a lot of disease. There was a lot of mold going into harvest, which can affect your yield. Um, and this year we saw the flip side of that where drought or the lack of rain can lead to plants drying out um, and we did see some drought damage in, in our fields this year. Another thing to keep in mind is that hemp is very photoperiod sensitive, which means that it flowers depending on the day length. So we saw flowering shortly after the summer solstice or the end of June in 2019. And in 2020, we actually saw it right before the summer solstice. So late planting could result in lower yields just due to the length of, of the growing season. Um, I'm going to quickly go through um, this trial, our agronomic trial, which I introduced in the video, where we have two different varieties, three different planting densities, and then three different nitrogen rates. Um, we had this at two different locations for both 2019 and 2020. In 2019, we planted um, or in the first few weeks of June, and then we harvested the first few weeks of September. In 2020, we were able to get planted about two weeks before that at the, at the end of May. Um, and that earlier planting date translated into an earlier harvest date. Um, but even though it was kind of planted earlier and harvested earlier, we still ended up with about the same length of growing season between about 90 and 100 days. Some general observations is that the plants grow and flower really quickly. Um, so in 2019, we actually saw that between the end of June and early July, the average plot height doubled on a week to week basis. Um, and then again, with the flowering around the time of the summer solstice. This is just a quick timeline photo here from 2019, where we can see looking at that June 17th date um, and then going into July 8th, just that difference between a few weeks and where it can go from just being a few inches to well over waist high. Um, so every time you go out and look at these fields or these plants, it looks very different. These are a few photos um, leading up to harvest last year. Something to keep in mind is that as pollination ends and grain development begins, the plants will start to lose um, their leaves. And that's just because it's kind of taking energy and putting it towards making sure that that grain develops. Another thing to keep in mind is after pollination is done, the male plants will die. Um, their job is done, pollination has occurred, um, so they will die off. So if you go out into your fields and see that things are starting to yellow and those plants are dying, that is normal. I won't have any 2020 data for a few weeks yet, um, but we can look back at what we saw last year. And kind of the main thing to take away is that we're not necessarily seeing an increase in yield when we move from 60 to 120 pounds per acre. When we look at grain yields for Arlington, we did see that there was some interactions between seeding rate and nitrogen rate. Um, but if you look at the green bars, which are the center bar in each, um, we don't see that as we move. We clearly see that there's a benefit to adding nitrogen, but we're not seeing that difference between the 60 and 120 pound rate. Um, if we look at Chippewa Falls, we see that same trend. And then if we break it down into varieties, this is the only time that we saw the X59 variety um, doing better than the CRS1. If we look at fiber yields, we see the same story where between the varieties, it's just the CRS1 variety is doing better. Um, but when we look at the nitrogen rate, um, we're not seeing that advantage of increasing rate. For the variety trial, um, we expected going into this that we would see a lot of variation in our yield data. And this is because these varieties are coming from all over the world. So we're looking to see what varieties might be um, viable as options here in, in Wisconsin. So that's why we see um, a lot of differences in, in where our yields are at. This was an example of the grain yield last year between our two locations. Um, 
We did replicate the study again, about eight of the varieties are the same. Um, so it will be interesting to see how they fared across the two different environments. Lastly, I will touch on THC testing. Um, something to keep in mind is that we're not necessarily concerned with THC levels um, in grain and fiber varieties. They're not naturally producing a lot of THC or CBD. Um, so looking back at last year, we hardly saw any um, THC. And what we did see was that we had a few plots in our variety trial that did produce some, but if we look at our 0.3% limit here, we're still well under that. Um, so it's not as much of a concern when you're growing a, a variety where it's um, mainly for grain and fiber. Um, you still def definitely have to get tested and be compliant, um, but those results shouldn't be too high. With that to summarize, um, we're really hoping that all of this data can go forward and help um, growers as they move into this venture of growing hemp. But one thing to keep in mind is that there is a lot of challenges. We haven't figured everything out yet. Um, so if you're going to do this, you need to make sure you have a good plan. Um, and we're putting all of the information that we have up on our hemp website. Um, and that is the, the extension website is the best place to find all that info. This project wouldn't have happened without a lot of help from a lot of different people, um, namely our funding, which was through the UW Hemp Capacity Fund and a private donation by Mr. Tim Erdman. With that, that was a very quick overview, um, but I think we still have some time for questions for both myself and Jerry. Ashley, I think you have those. Yep. Thank you, Haley, for your presentation. I do have one question so far that did come across the chat. And Haley, I will give this question to you. Um, it's asking how will cross-pollination be controlled or dealt with? For example, I want to grow for CBD and my neighbor wants to grow for grain and fiber, including males that could potentially, could potentially ruin my CBD crop. Yeah, so that is a concern and there's not really a good way. You can't control pollination. Um, so that's why communication is really important. Um, make sure that if you are going to be growing hemp for CBD, if you talk to your neighbors, you know they want to grow for grain and fiber. Uh, making sure that there is a good amount of distance between those. Um, there are some studies out there on how far the pollen can travel. We're not necessarily looking at that, um, but that's communication, making sure that you're open and honest about what you're growing um, and have that as kind of the best way to go about that. Thank you, Haley. Have you, next question is, have you seen any impacts of applying more than sufficient nitrogen on your plots? So our study is a little bit limited with only the, the three rates, nothing, and then the 60 and 120 pounds. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal things that we hear from growers about applying a lot more nitrogen, um, but I can't speak specifically to applying more than you need because um, it's not necessarily a part of our study. Sorry, we don't have all the answers yet. What is the form uh, of nitrogen? We you're... used urea um, because we knew exactly what we were putting on. Um, so we did that at planting. Another question that has come through um, that they noticed in the UP that fiber hemp pollinated much earlier when there was no sign of flower on the CBD hemp. Did you look at that effect in your study at all? Um, so like I said, we saw flowering around the summer solstice both years that lasted through about the end of July. Um, I think Shelby might touch on when they were seeing flowering in their CBD plots, but I do believe it is a little bit later. So that um, can happen where, you know, we know that the hemp for grain and fiber is going to start pollinating at a certain time. Um, and that's more of a, yeah, I don't know the exact specifics on when Shelby start to flower, but I do believe it is 
well after. Um, that's not to say that that's a sure way to make sure that you don't have the cross pollination, um, but depending on where you are, that could happen. Okay, thank you, Haley. And Shelby is adding in the chat box that it's about six weeks later on average um, for the pollinating. And so with that, uh, to keep moving along, there are a few more questions that are popping in, but I'm going to save those uh, for later in our, in our um, presentation today. And so with that, thank you, Haley, and thank you, Jerry. And we are next going to move in to our economic update with hemp. And um, that is going um, to be presented to us today by Dr. Shahir Burney. And um, they're not able to be with us today, but we have the video recorded presentation. So we can move into our economic update. Hi folks, I'm Shahir Burney. I'm a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Wisconsin River Falls. Today I'll be talking about the economics of industrial hemp. I will start by talking about uh, what hemp, hemp looks like on the national stage. So we'll start with some national trends and then we'll, we'll drill, da drill down to some specifics regarding Wisconsin. I'll also talk about federal regulations, uh, changes that have occurred over the past year. And, uh, and I'll, I'll end with uh, talking a little briefly about what we at the University of Wisconsin are doing. Okay, uh, let's start with national trends. E, uh, and let's start with the 2019 season. So the size of the CBD market in the US in 2019 was estimated at about $4 billion. There's a few estimates out there, uh, $4 billion is about uh, reasonable. And it's grown rapidly over time. What's gonna happen next, uh, who knows? What we also saw in 2019 was a downward trend in CBD hemp prices. Uh, about midway through 2019 in July, uh, hemp biomass hit a, hit a max, it hit a high of $40 per pound, and uh, prices have been falling, falling since then. So as of J January 2020, the prices were about $10 per pound. So about a 75% decline in CBD hemp prices. What has driven uh, this trend? Well, uh, you know, basically it's excess of supply over demand. In 2019, we saw a large influx of uh, hemp growers uh, throughout the nation, and uh, that led to, led to a large increase in supply. Demand, however, has uh, started to taper off. So uh, Pan Exchange did this. Uh, Pan Exchange is the, uh, the organization that puts together the price index that's uh, followed in the industry. They, they did this uh, study where they estimated that uh, to cater to the entire CBD market in the US, we would need about 20,000 acres uh, worth of production uh, in 2019. Well, the harvested acres were actually 115,000 acres. So a huge, huge divide between demand and supply here. And whenever you see a situation like this, such a big excess of supply or demand, it's bound to put downward pressure on prices. So as of January, 2020, it was $10 per pound. And uh, we expect that this trend will continue. In 2020, um, hemp production pro was projected to decrease for the first time since 2014. Recall 2014 is the year that hemp was legalized as part of the 2014 Farm Bill. It was um, allowed to be grown for experimental pur purposes by the state, for, uh, by states. Uh, but ever since 2014, hemp production has been on an annual basis increasing pretty consistently. But uh, 2020 is the first year we'll see, uh, we're projected to see a decline. Licensed hemp acreage is expected to uh, fall by 9% to 32%. That's a range of, a pretty wide range of estimates because uh, it comes from multiple sources. So depending on what source you look at, you'll get 9% or 32%. However, the takeaway is the same that we, we can expect to see a significant decline in licensed hemp acreage. And remember, licensed hemp, hemp acreage doesn't mean harvested acreage. So uh, harvested acreage is going to be, of course, even lower than that. So even though the acreage is falling, the, the license acreage has fallen, the number of licensed growers has actually increased in the nation by, by 27%. Part of it is driven by the fact that um, other states uh, that had not been producing before 
are have legalized hemp as well. So uh, large states such as Texas and Florida are going to have their first uh, growing season in 2020. Uh, as a result of that, we see uh, we're going to see more uh, about 27 percent increase in the number of people growing hemp. Also note that many growers have also exited the industry. That means that uh, the, the number of incomers, the market entrants, have to exceed 27% to compensate for the people who are leaving the industry as well. So that, that's sort of what it looks like for uh, the outlook looks like for this year. This is a map that shows total license acreage for 2020 by state. These uh, dark orange uh, states, these are the big players in the market. So California, Arizona, Colorado, Tennessee, Kentucky. These are the states that have uh, more than 30,000 license acres. Uh, so these are the large player, uh, players. The lighter shade of orange there, that's 10,000 to 30,000 acres. Um, and Wisconsin, note that Wisconsin falls in that region. Uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, Missouri, Michigan. The lighter shade of green, that's 1,000 to 10,000. License acreage, that's Minnesota right there. And then the dark green ones are less than 1,000 acres. So these are the very small um, uh, hemp programs here. Uh, so let's talk about some data for Wisconsin. This, this chart comes from the Wisconsin DATCAP, uh, Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection. Uh, a lot to unpack here. If you look at the bottom of the graph, uh, this is three years worth of data, 2018, 2019, and 2020. The dark green bars represent hemp growers and the light green bars represent hemp processors. Um, the, under each year, you have uh, the number of licensed growers and processors and the number of uh, growers and process, processors that were licensed and registered. So if you look at the licensed and registered growers and processors, you see about 180 and 78 in 2018, very small number, and then a large, a, a huge exponential rise in 2019 as a lot of new people, new, uh, new farmers entered the industry. So it increased about 1251 and 560. And uh, you know, if you follow this trend, we would expect to see a larger increase um, in, 20, in the year 2020. We'd expect to see these license, license of registration handed out by Wisconsin that have increased in 2020. However, we actually see a slight decline. So uh, in 2020, the number of uh, growers that were licensed and registered it's about 1224 and for processors it was about 585. So processors were slightly higher, growers were slightly lower. Um, nonetheless, the point here is that um, it didn't increase uh, for all intents and purposes. We can say it you know, was relatively stable between the two years. So here's another evidence that uh, you know, the number of people growing hemp is actually starting to decline or at least increase at a decreasing rate. This map I put together by um, taking data from the Wisconsin DATCAP as well. This is um, planned hemp acres by county in Wisconsin. So here's where they ask growers uh, how much they plan to grow. And as you can see uh, around the, the Rock County, Dane County area, that's where the majority of hemp production is going on. Uh, Rock County is the largest one, I think. It, uh, there's four, over 1,400 acres uh, for Rock County. Dane County is the next big one. And then their surrounding counties are similar. So that's where a lot of the hemp production is concentrated. Other parts of the state, especially the northern parts and uh, closer to the Twin Cities, not as much. Federal regulations. I'll start by talking about what didn't change. So uh, it is still illegal, as far as the FDA is concerned, to market CBD as an additive to food. Um, or animal feed or as a dietary supplement. That is still not, uh, CB, uh, FDA has still not allowed that. And um, FDA still has not allowed CBD to be used for medical purposes with one notable exception, which is epilepsy treatment. So that's the only thing that the FDA has approved. There are no other FDA approved drug products containing CBD to date. Let's talk about what did change. Crop insurance is now available for hemp farmers. As of the 2020 growing season, uh, hemp farmers are uh, qualified to purchase crop insurance. Uh, multiple policies are available for them. First one is multi peril crop insurance. This is insurance that provides coverage against the loss of yield for CBD grain and fiber hemp. So all three types of hemp. The second one is NAP. 
uh, stands for Non-Insured Disaster Assistance Program, uh, which provides losses against adverse uh, losses uh, incur, uh, incurred by farmers due to adverse weather, which may lead to lower yields, strike crops, and prevent planting. And this one is also available for all three types of hemp, CBD, grain, and fiber. And the last one here is uh, whole farm revenue protection. This is not crop specific. This covers your whole farm, um, and the income of the whole farm. Uh, it provides cover, uh, loss of, and cover, covers against loss of total farm income. So uh, all three of these policies, uh, of these insurance types are available for hemp farmers now, uh, which was not available in the past. Another, another thing that's available in the 2020 growing season, uh, FSA farm loans. So hemp farmers can, are now eligible for FSA farm loans of all types, operating ownership, beginning farmer and farm storage facility loans. Um, all of these loans can be um, taken by a hemp farm. Okay, so what are the University of Wisconsin economists up to? Uh, myself included, uh, we, us at the University of Wisconsin River Falls and University of Wisconsin Madison, uh, in 2019, uh, 2019, actually earlier this year in January, we released this study we did conducted in 2019 of uh, the hemp industry in Wisconsin. The idea was to uh, collect data on the first growing season, which is 2018, um, and figure out, um, just to get a feel of uh, how growers are doing, what, what are the challenges they're facing, uh, what are some estimates for cost of production, yields and market prices and things like that. So uh, that, that was the goal of this study. Uh, what we saw was there was a lot of uncertainty in the first growing season. That is not surprising at all. Uh, and we expect that to uh, equilibrate over time. If you want to take a look at the full study, this is actually a hyperlink. So if you have access to this PowerPoint, if you just click on that uh, 2019 Wisconsin Hemp Marketing Study, it's going to take you to the full study. Uh, otherwise, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the full link for the marketing study. You can use that as well. Here's an example of the type of information we included in there. So one of the tables is on yields we estimated. Uh, yields for different types of hemp. Uh, CBD floral is um, CBD, CBD hemp grown for smokable flour, and then biomass, uh, seed grain and fiber, large variation in yields. And then um, here's another table. This is for prices. Um, of course, flora, smokable flour garners um, the, the, the biggest premium. So the highest prices uh, of hemp because it has a higher CBD content. Hi folks, I'm sure you're burning. All right, so that was the um, Wisconsin. presentation that um, Dr. Cherie sent and he's not available to be here, but we can put his contact information up at the end if you do have more questions. Um, otherwise, um, some of these questions that you could have from this may get answered as we go further into our presentations today. Um, so now that we've gone through the update on our green and fiber, Shelby, and can you hear me, Ashley? Um, I, can. I think there's still a few minutes on that video. Can you try to go to the last few minutes? Because I believe that um, Hi, a section, I, I think it ended somehow at the last few minutes. Oh. Um, I thought that he, because there is a 2020 study that I know that he wanted to put in a plug in for. So I want to see. Sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties. <laughs> also talk about. We will see if we can get it to pop up here. Yeah, just, sorry, maybe it cut off with, um, oh, here is, it is here, I think. So maybe right around 15 play. You directly, if, if you wanna do that, just send me an email. And my contact information is on the next slide, so just get in touch, and um, you know I can I can send it to you. So that's all I have. Uh, if you have questions and comments, feel free to get in touch with me.
So if you'd like to be part of this. And grain producers and livestock uh, project. Uh, Veggie Compass is a, a set of spreadsheets that uh, growers can use uh, and to input their own data in there, and it's going to spit out grower specific uh, information specific to uh, the grower's farm. And uh, the type of information is there, there's a whole detail, a whole gamut of information it puts out, such as a uh, cost of production estimates, such as uh, profitability measures by different types of market channels, organic versus non-organic, things like that. Um, and so, uh, and a lot of other good variables for financial man management purposes. That's the Veggie Compass project. It, it exists currently for vegetable growers, grain, uh, organic grain producers and livestock. Uh, we're, gonna, we're developing the same thing for, uh, for hemp. That, that's the idea here. So, this will be a tool that hemp growers can use to input their inf own information and um, uh, use the metrics for financial management of the hemp farm. So uh, we're going to be conducting focus groups in about mid to late fall. We would love to have as much participation from hemp growers in the state as possible. The bigger group we have, the more accurate our, uh, our estimates are going to be. So if you'd like to be part of this project, if you'd like, if you'd like to participate in these focus groups, uh, please get in touch with me. We'd love to or, have you and have yeah. you to call us. And uh, early next year, sometime mid to late January, we're going to start distributing a wide scale survey as well, which will help us uh, construct these tools here. Uh, so if you're a hemp grower in Wisconsin, you're very likely going to receive one. And uh, I, um, I request that uh, you make it a point to uh, fill that out. If you'd like, uh, I can send it to you directly. If, if you want to do that, just send me an email. And my contact information is on the next slide. So just get in touch and um, you know, I, can, I can send it to you. So that's all I have. Uh, if you have questions and comments, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, here's my email address, shahir.burney at uwrf.edu. At the bottom there is my phone number as well for my office line. So you can call me if you'd like. Uh, once again, I'm in the, the Department of Agricultural Economics at the U University of Wisconsin River Falls. And um, that's all I had. Yeah, if you have questions, comments, please um, don't hesitate to get in touch. Otherwise, uh, that's it for me. Thank you for listening. All right. I apologize for that minor technical glitch there. And um, Shelby, for those of you following on Zoom, um, Shelby did put the link to the study into the chat box. And we do have some more questions that are coming in. Um, but like I said, we will get to those a little bit later. Uh, there are a couple questions regarding if we will be uh, sending out this recording or if it will be on YouTube to view at a later time. And the answer is yes to both of those. It may take us a little bit to final, um, make sure our closed captioning and everything is updated. But for those that registered, we will have this available at a later time for you. So with that, we are going to move into our next segment of our meeting today and presentations with the update on the essential oil research. So Shelby, I will hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, if we wanna, so hello everybody. I will play my video too, because I'm a, a person, but um, so welcome. We'll play this video quickly. Hi, I'm Shelby Austin, Assistant Professor in the Department of Horticulture at UW-Madison. And as you can see today, I am out in our hemp cultivar trial. So there are several different cultivar trials that are happening this summer in 2020. This one is particularly dealing with essential oil production, or what you might be more familiar with is uh, CBD, cannabidiol, or CBG production. These are some of the most common cannabinoids that are extracted from hemp. So a little refresher of where those compounds come from. So all of the plants that are in this field are female. Uh, hemp is a dioecious crop. There are both males and females. For cannabinoid production, the oil is extracted from unpollinated female plants. So all of the plants here are females. Um, we're just getting into flowering and, and that's the part of the plant that will be extracted. So a little background about this trial. 
Um, there are three main uh, components of the trial. I'm growing, and, and I should mention, this, the purpose of this variety trial is really to understand what, what cultivars perform well in Wisconsin so we can make better recommendations to Wisconsin producers. So we are looking at 42 different cultivars in this trial in three main categories auto flowering types there are four cultivars and these are varieties that do not depend on day length so they typically will flower after about 45 days or 60 days and be finished by 75 85 days so these are far into flowering right now and they'll be harvested soon we also have this photo period sensitive trial around me this is the seedling trial these were grown from seed i planted in the greenhouse in mid uh, may and then they were then transplanted into this field about a month later. So we have 24 different cultivars grown from seed in this trial. So these are gonna be dependent on photo period for when they start flowering. So you can see maybe there's a little bit of variation. So some have been flowering for about two weeks while some have been flowering for about four weeks and some haven't even started flowering. And that's really gonna be dependent on the amount, the ratio of day length that they're getting. So sun versus darkness and they really will start flowering when um, you're getting less than 14 hours of sunlight in a day. So we'll see that uh, flowering period happen all the way into mid-September when these will start uh, blooming. So besides the seedling trial, beyond me is the clone production. So as I had mentioned, all these are females. If you have clonal production, you're going to see a lot more uniformity within your clones. They're typically taken from a female plant that's growing vegetatively. Uh, a clone is cut and propagated, and then I then planted those about a month after I received those cuttings uh, at the end of June. And again, much more uniformity in the clone. They're genetically uh, identical. However, there are some benefits to growing seedlings over clones, such as the seedlings have a much stronger taproot system and can really anchor the plant in for strong wind events or for accessing water. So, but you'll see more genetic variability in the seedlings. So what, um, this is the summer of COVID, so we were act, uh, limited in what we we're able to grow and do this summer. So I am working on this trial in collaboration with Michigan State University Extension up with um, in Chatham, Michigan with James DeDecker. He's growing the same cultivars that are in this trial and also uh, working with Michael Fields Egg Institute uh, in East Troy, Wisconsin. So we have three different locations growing the same cultivars, taking the same traits. So some of those traits include, as I'd mentioned earlier, the flowering time is an important trait. We're also scouting for various pest insects and disease pressure. Are they preferentially attracted to certain cultivars over others? Things like plant height and architecture for understanding what's going to fit under different cultivation systems. And then um, once we get into the flowering, what most producers are interested in is how much of that cannabinoid concentration is in the plant. So once they start flowering, we'll sample at three weeks, five weeks, and seven weeks post flowering and get a gauge on the CBD, THC, and if there's any CBG in these cultivars and kind of understand that trend to see when we can make recommendations of when farmers are going to want to harvest before the crops become too hot or have too much THC concentration. And then finally, at the end of the season, after we take that last uh, cannabinoid analysis, we'll, we'll chop these plants down at the base. And then in the field, you know, they'll come out about 60% moisture. We need to dry them down to about 10% moisture. And then the floral material will be bucked off. So you'll, you'll kind of strip off the flowers and then that dried flower material will be weighed to calculate a total yield on the uh, particular cultivar based on the cannabinoid content at harvest and the total dry biomass weight. So all of the data from this trial will be available on our UW Extension hemp website as well as the other locations. I should mention this is part of another uh, joint effort that we have going, another joint effort with the across the Midwest. We have four different institutions that are working on creating a Midwestern hemp database. So Phil Alberti, an extension agent at the University of Illinois, um, kind of thought up this database where he wanted producers to be able to join a program to get um, 
to you know feed the program information about their experience with various cultivars and their farming practices so what's their row spacing what irrigation are they using what nutrients what varieties are they growing and then this is in collaboration with rock river laboratory where they'll be sending all of their samples for hemp potency analysis to get that cannabinoid content and this will go into a public database where people will be able to look at a given variety, look at all the locations it was grown under what production systems to feel, figure out what works best for them. So we also at UW-Madison are participating in that and the results from this trial are being um, integrated into that database as well as Michigan State Extension with James DeDecker and with Marguerite Bolt at um, Purdue University. So collectively we have about 400 farmers that are in that trial. Um, or in that database that will be contributing information. So definitely check out the Midwestern Hemp Database. That's going to be, there's going to be links at all four of our institutions to that resource. So that's that. All right, so I'm going to try here to take over. Um, it says that I'm controlling the screen. Looks like, am I doing this? I think so. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to our virtual hemp field day. So I'm going to um, give an update as that video was taken about three or four weeks ago. Um, so we have a little bit of preliminary data coming out of that trial and then I'd be happy to take any questions. So just an update on some of the cannabinoid or essential oil research that we are doing at UW. Um, so just to reiterate, uh, so this variety trial or cultivar trial is focusing on CBD and CBG cultivars in collaboration with Michael Fields and Michigan State University. Um, we actually have 44 different cultivars in this trial um, with four different auto flower types, which were direct seeded at a spacing of one plant per foot. 26 uh, transplanted seedlings that were started in a greenhouse on May 12th, transplanted on June 15th, and 14 transplanted clones that were transplanted on June 23rd. And for our trial at uh, the Arlington Research Station as part of UW-Madison, we used a four foot spacing within row and a nine foot spacing between row, which is very, very wide, but we wanted the ability to get a tractor through to do some cultivation later in the season for weed management. You can see that I also used a four foot wide black plastic. So we used plastic culture that was just based on experience from last year um, to help with weed control and especially in our very, very limited um, employee summer help this summer because of COVID and social distancing. <laughs> I was taking all the help I could get with weed control. Um, no other inputs. We did soil tests. Later, we tested the plants for nutrient deficiencies and everything was A-OK. -okay, so there, there were no other additional inputs into this field. And then I'll be presenting some of the data that we collected from this, um, from this trial. Sorry, I'm seeing things pop up on my screen. So a little bit here, um, just looking at the growth progression of these plants uh, over the summer. So remember they went in in the middle of June. Um, so kind of the first two, three weeks didn't see much growth and then starting about mid-July to about mid-August, um, on average plants were growing six inches to a foot a week. So tremendous growth. It was a good year we got just the right amount of rain at the right time up until about three weeks ago. And I'll talk about that soon. So, so very good growth and just a snapshot of what that looks like. Um, so here, just focusing on the seedlings. So the seedlings, I think thrived um, this year in our growing environment. So they, those were plants that we, uh, we direct, we seeded in the greenhouse, transplanted a month later. They had a nice strong tap root system, were able to get water when they needed to. So this is the distribution of the height of those in centimeters. So you can see a very nice normal distribution other than these little small uh, kind of scraggly plants, a few of which were actually auto flowers. So um, there was quite a bit of uniform, or there were quite a few cultivars that did have differences within the cultivar, um, including some of that autoflowering traits popping up 
and that explains some of those really small plants. So uh, this is the average height on September 5th. It was right around 136 centimeters or four and a half feet, but you can see a very nice normal distribution of plant height there. Um, so what were some of the pests that we observed? A lot of the same, same things that I saw last year, but in different frequencies, which was interesting. So um, early on in the season, early July, I saw a lot of corn borer coming in. Um, of course, the hemp borer, which is probably the most common insect pest or the most detrimental insect pest. Um, we saw some of that, not quite as much as last year. Um, I mentioned that we had that really large facing for weed control with nine feet. Uh, so we took this rototiller through just one pass this year. Weeds weren't so much of an issue, but we had a really nice low uh, seed bank in our field when we selected that location. So luckily didn't have to deal with weeds. Um, interestingly, those, those cultivars that did have auto flower, either the auto flowering cultivars or some of the full season varieties that were segregating for auto flowers, that um, because of that tight bud structure in the inflorescence, we saw a lot of bud rot or botrytis. And now as all the other plants are starting to flower, we're starting to see some of that, but it was much more noticeable in those really early season um, cultivars. Down on the left here, we see downy mildew. So about three weeks ago in Arlington, it started raining and it didn't stop for about two weeks. I think we got at least four inches, huge wind events, lots and lots of rain. So we got a lot of downy mildew pressure, um, a lot of lodging of the plants tipping over or completely breaking. This was more apparent in the clones than in the seedling varieties. So I really think that that taproot system is doing something to anchor those plants in and make them stronger. A lot of leaf spot or leaf septoria also coming in after those late rains. Um, and I saw a question in the chat box. So out of my whole field, which was about a thousand plants that we have in the trial, I have one plant that was Monisha's that had both male and female flowers. So I had asked for feminized seed or for clones and uh, the companies delivered. So good job on that. So very happy to not have to deal with too much uh, extraneous pollen. Um, so a report, I, oops, just going here. Trying to advance to the next slide, but it's taking its sweet time here. Oop, now it went too far. Okay, so um, I did reach out to PJ Leash at the UW-Madison Insect Diagnostic Lab to kind of get a report on what people were having problems with across the state for insects. He said that the most common insect reported again was that Eurasian hemp borer. Also some spider mite um, issues that's gonna be happening more where there's a drier environment. We did have a stretch of um, mid-July to mid-August that was a little bit dry across the state. So more prevalent there. Japanese beetles. I have seen a lot of Japanese beetles, but they, they don't seem to do that much harm, which is good. Tarnish paint bug, plant bug, and cannabis aphids, which if you have a large population of lady beetles, will do a good job at fighting against those cannabis aphids. Talking to Brian Huddleston, Huddleston at the Plant Diagnostics Clinic, um, the two primary diseases right now, foliar diseases, are downy mildew and that yellow leaf spot or septoria um, again, that's coming on when you get a lot of late season rains and you have compact, your plants are very tightly packed in together. I imagine the tritus will start picking up now as we get closer to harvest and the bud structure is getting tighter as well. There is this um, insect and mite pest guide here that uh, Russ Groves, Ryan Jensen, and PJ Leash put out last spring or this previous spring that talks about some of the common insects observed in um, in Wisconsin. So you can check that link out um, or just look up insect and mite pests in field grown hemp in Wisconsin uh, to find out more. And it talks a little bit about cultural control, but as most of you on the call are familiar, there are still very limited resources for synthetic um, pesticide or herbicides. So, so mostly cultural practices for managing uh, both insects and and pathogens in the field are what people are using currently. 
try to advance. Um, so a little bit more data from that. So for, for my trial with these 44 different cultivars, I saw again, a very nice normal distribution across flowering time um, with, sorry, when I get a comment, it blocks the screen. Um, so, so the first flowers, those auto, auto flowering varieties were at 50% flowering. So that meant of, the, of those plants that were in the field, at least 50% were starting to show flowering starting as soon as June, July 20th. Again, that's still about a month after some of the fiber and grain crops start flowering. So there is a temporal difference in flowering between the CBD and grain and fiber varieties. However, since they do both have these normal distributions, you will get a little overlap. We saw that the average amount of, um, the average of the trial was flowering the week of August 10th. And I actually still had some plants that just reached that 50% mark at the end of August. So it will be interesting to see if those plants can finish before we get our first hard freeze in Arlington, which will happen about mid-October. So very, very preliminary data on the cannabinoids. This is what everyone wants to see, but I must urge that this is very, very early. Um, so again, for the cannabinoids, I was really interested in the trend across all these cultivars. So after they reached that 50% flowering, oh, how did that change? Trying to go back, no. <laughs> Someone's fighting with me. <laughs> okay. I'm trying, oh my gosh. <laughs> is it gonna stay there? It, um, <laughs> I think what happens is the screen gets touched to close the comments and then it advances the slides. So preliminary data on the cannabinoids taking samples at three weeks, five weeks, and seven weeks after flowering. So only a few, we only have five of our 44 cultivars that have been harvested at this point, and those are mostly uh, the auto flower types. So if you look at the total CBD here, you see that they're all hovering around 5%. One of those has zero, and that's because it was a CBG variety. So then if you look at the counterpoint, you see total CBG a little bit over 6%. Um, so that trend is going to, I imagine, increase a lot with the full season maturity. Um, but what we do see a slow progression. Um, looking at total THC, which everyone's interested at, even at the first, even looking after three weeks of flowering, we already see one sample that is over um, the THC threshold. And I imagine as we get to week seven, we're going to have quite a few of those. What that might end up being is that this week five is going to be kind of that sweet spot for harvesting while staying compliant for THC. And then the CBD THC ratio, which I think is really important, it's kind of common knowledge that right now the best varieties or cultivars available right now are 30 to one, which is that once you get to 0.3% THC and 10% CBD, that's about the best combination of those two compounds that you're able to find. And what we see here is the majority of our cultivars between maybe 20 and 30 for that ratio um, with some of these really, really early flowering varieties that we have not, not coming close to that 30 to one ratio. So that's really where we're going to be pushing the envelope is trying to break that 30 to one barrier for the CBD to THC ratio, which will allow people to have more than 10% CBD without while remaining compliant. So this is very preliminary. As I said, we're just starting to uh, reach the seventh week um, and we'll be sharing all these results with you at the end of the season. So um, just a few other things that we're working on. So we are also part of the S1084 essential oil trial, which is a multi-state collaboration. Um, I think that there's uh, over 10 different states that are participating in this trial. Uh, our location is up in Buffalo County and we have Carl Dooley on the call who is running this trial and he's, he'll be available after uh, my presentation to comment more on it or if you have specific questions. 
This is looking at six cultivars, two auto flowering and four photoperiod sensitive. This was direct seeded, so different than my trial, which was transplanted. Um, direct seeded and has a much less, uh, a much more dense planting density. So the autos are one plant every foot and the photoperiod sensitive at every foot and a half. Um, so you can see an aerial view there. We had a, a dr some drone footage. You see that tighter planting density and there's a whole suite of traits that are being collected. Really interesting because we'll be able to compare this across different states with the different climates and latitudes and, and really compare how these varieties are doing across the country. So please ask Carl any questions if you have about that trial. We're going up on Sunday to, to harvest the autoflowers. Can't wait. <laughs> um, one other thing that I'm very passionate about and I think is really interesting, I mentioned in the introduction to this uh, whole field day that we grew a lot of hemp in the 1930s and 40s and remaining from that hemp that was grown is what are these feral hemp populations. They've been thriving in our climate for the past 70 years, kind of without any human intervention. So are really nicely acclimated to our region. Um, this, is, this picture was taken earlier this week. I'm currently uh, scouting all the Wisconsin landscape for feral hemp populations. You can see these plants must be at least 12, at least 14 feet tall because they're not even cut at the bottom. If you have any feral hemp populations, let me know. This will also help to populate the new U.S. Uh, hemp seed bank, which will be going in Geneva, New York, which is a really important resource that we do not have as hemp researchers or breeders um, or hemp stakeholders right now. So trying to repopulate that with germplasm is really important. Um, some other things that we're involved with. Uh, the Wisconsin Crop Innovation Center, which is part, oh no, <laughs> go back. The Wisconsin Crop Innovation Center, which is part of UW-Madison. Um, so they're a biotechnology and genomics um, facility and they actually have succeeded in genetically engineering hemp, which they believe might be the first hemp crop to be genetically engineered in the world. Um, they received funding from the uh, WARF Accelerator Grant to look at engineering traits um, through genetic engineering and gene editing, including 0% THC lines, high CBG and high CBD lines, increased um, flower and trichome density, as well as traits like Roundup resistance and disease resistance. So they're currently doing that in a kind of experimental capacity. They also have an HPLC designated for hemp potency analysis, which we um, use for a lot of our trialing. And they're contracting and can contract with external companies that are interested in looking at specific traits. So here you can see a picture of that edited uh, hemp plant. So this was with a test stream that would make that plant glow red under a certain light. So plants that had a successful genetic transformation show that trait under light versus those that were not successfully transformed. So pretty interesting. Um, just a few other research projects to touch on. Um, I conducted a national hemp research needs survey um, in early, end of 2019, early 2000, 2020, what year is it? Um, to identify hemp research and education priorities. And this was presented at the uh, National Hemp Research Conference this summer. Over 1,500 people responded to that survey. And I am currently writing the publication. It should be published this fall. But it was really getting at ideas of what we should be focusing on our research efforts and um, forming collaborations that will be fruitful for the hemp industry. Uh, I also have a uh, in collaboration with Dylan Bruce and West Organics, we're working on an organic fertility trial, looking at different organic fertilizer treatments to determine how they affect biomass and cannabinoid content. So at the bottom of the screen here, um, this is just kind of looking at different common organic fertility regimes and seeing how increased, um, particularly amounts of nitrogen contribute to that biomass yield. And indeed, we see that as we increase the amount of N in our uh, treatment, we get a higher biomass. But interestingly, the cannabinoid data, we don't see a, tr um, a statistical difference in the amount of cannabinoid content with increased nitrogen. So this is uh, one year from 2019, we're repeating it in 2020. So we'll have those results later this year. I'm also collaborating with Lakota Royal Ojibwa Community College on a companion cropping study, which we're very excited about 
which will look at the effect of companion cropping on yield pest management and income or revenue um, on a per acreage basis. And uh, the Midwestern Hemp Database, I touched about this in the video, and uh, Philip Alberti will be presenting on that in his regional update. So, um, so many people to acknowledge, this is the labor of many, many people. And I'd first like to thank Shanai, Daniela, Liam, and Dan for this summer helping me in the field. Um, it's been challenging under COVID and they have helped a tremendous amount, so thank you. Lots of collaborators across the Midwest, the different extension agents and educators and different um, institutions such as Michael Fields and West Star and Rock River that have played a big role in making these projects successful. Successful funding from the University of Wisconsin Hemp Capacity Funds and a, a very special donation from Tim Erdman that made this uh, really this research kick off at the UW Wisconsin, UW Madison uh, in 2019 when we were first starting. And then finally, all of the provide the seed companies that provided seed for these trials, I really appreciate because um, yeah, they wouldn't have happened without the donation. And then um, I think now we're going to open it up for questions and. This will be specific to kind of what I talked about and um, relating to essential oil research at UW. Thank you, Shelby. Um, we do have a couple minutes here for, for a couple of questions. And um, you may have touched on a couple of these already, but one of the questions was, how is CBD or CBG extracted from the flowers? Yeah, um, so there, there's a few different extraction techniques, but typically they're done either using a solvent such as ethanol or um, people, the common are ethanol or carbon dioxide, a supercritical carbon dioxide. And so that's pretty much where you're going to soak it in these different solvents and it will extract those cannabinoids. And then depending on downstream processes, you either extract kind of what is a crude extract that will have all of the cannabinoids as well as things like terpenes or different um, lipids that are in that plant, or you can go through further steps of refinement, distillation um, that will isolate the comments and make them, the, the compounds and make them more pure. But ethanol and CO2 extraction are probably the most commonly used extraction methods right now. Thank you. The next question is regarding the 10% moisture content, would you recommend to still put dry packs into storage bags to prevent mold during the storage time? Well, it really, I mean, 10% is, is even kind of pushing it. 10 to 15, I think is fine. It really depends on your final market. If it is for biomass and you have a large quantity of biomass, you really are going to want to just do what you can. If you're, if you're trying for a, a cured or smokable flower market where you're trying to get a higher price point, then you want to take your time, dry slowly, cure it, where you're going to pay more special attention to the drying process, in which case you, you definitely want to control that moisture level. But I truly think that it's kind of um, garbage in, garbage out situation. So remove any source of potential contamination during the drying process. If you start to see botrytis in your plants, you want to get rid of that, it will set the rest of the batch uh, in the wrong direction. <laughs> the next question for you, um, it says in March, there was a webinar about novel CBD production where they talked about using dioecious seed from for CBD project production instead of feminized seed only. Is that something you are looking at at UW or doing any trials with that method? Yes, and, and actually um, <laughs> that company I saw is on the call uh, that had that seminar and um, New West Genetics, they, so actually in our grain and fiber trial, we have uh, that variety growing. So we're testing it, Haley's testing it. I didn't want the pollen by my Close of our trial, but it is being tested in our grain and fiber trial, so we will be able to compare the results with that. And that's certainly something that's of interest for um, larger scale production. It's going to be much easier to be able to um, not have to be concerned with males and mechanically harvest that material. 
as well as have a secondary crop of grain production. Thank you. I'll do uh, one more quick question and then we will keep uh, moving on and we'll get to the rest of the questions at the end. I just want to stay on track here today. So the next question is, there any research on grafting with hemp, like better root system or uniform growth? Yeah, um, so first of all, I'll try to answer questions in the chat too, and I'm sorry to not be able to get through all of them right now, but um, very interesting with the grafting question. Uh, I actually started to try to do some hemp grafting early in the spring, and it was right before COVID happened, so I had some root stocks and I was trying to do that. Um, I think it's really interesting, especially because a lot of hemp is clonally propagated. Um, so it's kind of ripe for the taking to do some grafting experiments. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in that. I had as mentioned, I had just started on it. I'm not sure if there's other people looking at it, but I do think that it will be an area research. The question will just be whether um, clonal propagation continues to be common um, if we move more to a seed-based system, then that rootstock uh, or clonal propagation might not be as, as useful. But uh, certainly if you, you graft onto a, a nice hardy root system, you might be able to grow some monster plants <laughs> or change the flowering time and all kinds of interesting things. This is my research brain going, let's do it. <laughs> Thank you, Shelby. So, um, our next segment, um, we are going to get a Midwestern regional hemp update, but before we do that, we do have a quick poll for those of you that are over Zoom um, for our demographic data that we do collect through UW um, and for funding purposes. So if you are able and willing to answer that would the poll, we're just going to take about 45 seconds to a minute. And then we will start in with our regional hemp, uh, hemp updates, industrial hemp updates. And we will have each of the speakers uh, go through their updates. And then we will do questions at the end after all of them have gone. And I will take those questions along with the other questions that we still have popping up in the chat box from Haley and Shelby. And I also know I do have some questions coming in um, over YouTube as well, and we will be getting to those and answering those live today. And once again, I'd like to thank everybody that is joining us for our UW-Madison Division of Extension Industrial Hemp Virtual Field Day and Update. Yeah, we'll give it about another uh, 40 seconds here. Ashley, and then we'll close the poll and move on to uh, the uh, video from Illinois. Sounds or good. No, Phil Phillip's online, I believe. I'm sorry. Correct? Yes. I'm, get I'm getting my slides mixed up. Okay. We'll give it 30 seconds and we'll resume. I am here, but it's going to be a, a recorded video. Oh, it is. Okay. Thank you, Philip. And while we're just um, waiting and finishing up the poll, our first uh, regional update and is going to be from the University of Illinois from Phil Albert. And it, it is a video, but he is on live to be able to answer questions uh, once we get through all of the updates. And uh, Phil is a extension educator through the University of Illinois. Hello everybody, my name is Philip Alberti and I'm a commercial agriculture educator with the University of Illinois Extension. Today I'm going to talk to you about the collective effort known as the Midwestern Hemp Database. Topics to be covered quickly include a program overview, a database demonstration, some of the current observations that we have and resources which are available to you. This project builds upon the UW-Madison THC CBD tool created by University of Wisconsin Extension educator Liz Benversi. This project is a collaboration between several grant institutions, private laboratories, and grower cooperators across the region. This includes the University of Illinois Extension, University of Wisconsin-Madison, Purdue University Extension, and Michigan State University Extension. 
The laboratories include Rock River Laboratory and Pride Analytics and Consulting, as well as 140 grower cooperators across the four states. The goal of this project will be to provide insight into agronomic performance and cannabinoid development of industrial hemp varieties. This is of importance as many varieties are being grown across the region from different suppliers without having reliable data on their performance. In addition, as with, as with the impending adoption of USDA rules, 2020 has become a very valuable year to gain information. In short, participation in this program provides an exciting opportunity to receive significantly discounted cannabinoid profiling in exchange for providing information regarding uh, individual production systems, agronomic performance, and cannabinoid development of specific hemp varieties. To participate in this study, specific instructions regarding floral sampling and shipping must be followed to ensure participation into the program and integrity of the data that we collect. This information is being made public via a data sharing tool, the Midwestern Hemp Database, and any identifying information will be kept confidential and will not be shared via the public tool. With that, let's take a look at the database itself. So if you click on the link here or just follow it, go.illinois.edu slash hemp database, and it will take you here. Uh, the database is quite large, so I typically like to zoom out just a little bit to really see uh, the interactions with the tool itself. When you click on the link, it'll take you here. Uh, this is the database interface. If you scroll down slightly, you can see all sorts of graphs and figures containing all the information we have collected in the program so far. The top portion of the database contains information on production practices and systems, including row spacing, previous crop, irrigation system, etc. What you are looking at is all the data that we have. However, if you wish to refine your search, you can by using these specific filters we have at the top up here. So for instance, let's say we only want to look at the state of Wisconsin. And we would only like to look at varieties from a specific company, let's say Oregon CBD, just for an example. And what we can do is we can see all the information submitted from the growers on their uh, particular production practice. What previous crop they use, soil type, planting method, etc. And all the graphs and figures will be updated uh, to reflect the changes in those par parameters. However, if you scroll down to the bottom of the, of the database here, this is where the information really becomes uh, valuable for us. Um, so here are the results of the cannabinoid time course study that we've taken. These results have been updated weekly, uh, every Monday actually, and will continue to be updated throughout the remainder of the season. Um, as of September 14th, we have about 260 samples that are into the database. And going through these briefly, we have the table containing the information from the cannabinoid analysis for each sample. You can see information on the source, variety, sampling date, CBD, THC, CBG. You'll also notice a sample ID number. This will allow the same plants to be tracked over periods of a season if a grower sent in multiple samples. This table can be sorted any which way you want based off of a parameter of interest, if you want to look at variety or sampling date, et cetera. All this information is then visualized in several uh, scatter plots and, and figures which we've created here. Um, it's really just trying to visualize the information that we have available to you and, and make it a little easier on the eyes. You can see we've taken a little specific emphasis on THC and CBD, but all the other cannabinoids will be added to the database in a figure form uh, moving forward, is that you are even able to just kind of hover over these data points here to get specific information on sampling date, variety, source, uh, the sampling ID, and then information on that particular parameter, um, which then you can use that sample ID number, scroll back up to the table here, and get specific information on the other cannabinoids if it's really of interest to you. Again, this information will be um, interactive and, and kind of brought together a little bit better moving forward, but this is just kind of where we're at right now. Just a few observations of things that we're noticing from the database itself that we're now nearing the middle of September and harvest will be here before we know it for most of the full season varieties in the region. Now is the time to consider taking steps for harvest, whether that's notifying the appropriate regulatory agency or sending in samples through your state approved laboratories prior to harvest. As always, be caught up on the rules and regulations for growing compliant hemp in your state as they are quite different from each other. 
There are some earlier flowering and auto flower varieties entered into the beta database, which have different planting and harvesting schedules than typical full season varieties. This may explain why some of the cannabinoid values are significantly greater or appear as potential outliers. Hovering over the data points will reveal varietal and sampling information and which may provide some more clarity on that particular sample. Uh, this is mostly for our Illinois growers, but be aware of the difference between Delta 9 THC and total THC and how state and federal programs define compliance. This is a subtle but important distinction and will have impacts on end product use, potential for interstate commerce, and utilization of certain distribution channels. The database is in the early stages and will contain data pertaining to final cannabinoid accumulation and agronomic performance later this fall. The database is a living document and will be altered as needs and interests change to better serve our stakeholders. If you have any questions or comments, please contact me at palberti at illinois.edu or reach out to us on our website at go.illinois.edu slash hemp. That's all I have for now. Uh, with that, I'll take questions. Thank you very much, everybody, and looking forward to the rest of the meeting. Hello, everybody. My name is Philip Alberti, and I'm a commercial agriculture educator with the University. All right, uh, we're gonna be doing the questions at the end for our regional update here. So moving on, our next speaker is Esther Shakina, and she is from the Michael Fields Institute. So we will be hearing from her. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, hello, everybody. It's nice to meet you all in this virtual field day. Hello from Michael Fields. So Michael Fields is, uh, many of you might know about our institute. For those of you who haven't heard about us, we are um, NGO that's based in East Troy, Wisconsin, and we work through policy, research, and education uh, to help both the rural urban farms and agricultural communities in Wisconsin and beyond to be healthy environmentally, economically, and socially. So I'm not able to move this. If uh, Esther, if you want me to advance the slides, otherwise you can go up yeah, to that. Yeah, that would be helpful. Okay, I can just let me know when you want me to change them. Yeah, next one, please. So here, I'm just going to give a overview of what we did this year. Uh, we have been involved in hemp research for three years now. Uh, we started out in 2018, which is not a good year for grain hemp. And this year, we really uh, took off with grain hemp. And I just want to give you an update of both the grain hemp as, this, as well as the CBD hemp work that we are doing. Uh, the CBD work, we are uh, uh, working together with uh, Shelby uh, and um, Michigan State University, and most of the data of which uh, Shelby has presented. So I'll just uh, be quick and I'll just share our experiences with what uh, happened in our growing season this year. So with the, this is the just an overview of the grain hemp. Okay, so the varieties that we grew are the six varieties, Anka, Altair, Rytel, Vega, Pheromone, and Yuma Crosco. Um, so they were all uh, grown in 30 inch rows, planted on June 20, uh, June 15, and there was a wide var variation in the height. Uh, we saw that Anka and uh, Rigel are pretty tall varieties. They are between five to seven feet in height, but the uh, Vega was pretty short. Uh, we are still harvesting. We just started harvest yesterday, so I am not in a position to give our yield data, but I would be having a publication come out very soon by the end of this, by November for all these data. Next one. So this is just a picture of how our, uh, uh, after sowing, this is about like 14 days after sowing, the plants just germinating, the different varieties. Um, so you can see that Rigel was not as thick as uh, Vega, but we still, when I see the data, it still kind of catches up because of the big uh, colas that we had. So this is a variety Anka on the uh, 25th day after planting. And as Haley just pointed out, the height just doubles every two weeks. And it's, uh, you could see the difference in height. This is the 25th day, the next one. Okay, uh, so this is on the 40th day. So within 15 days, you could see the difference in height between all the varieties. Next one. And so this is a general view. This is time weeding. So we did one time weeding. We know this is organic production systems in microfield. So we were not able to use any uh, chemical. And so we did one uh, time weeding on the uh, 20, 32nd day after planting. And um, 
so it was pretty good. It was clear the plants were just able to take off. The main observation that we did with this is the, the competition that the grain hemp was able to give Canada thistle. And you can see that in, in areas where the plant was growing and uh, the population was pretty good, then you see the Canada thistle height was not there, but whenever there was an area of where the seeds didn't grow well, then you can see the difference in height. This is when the hemp rows are uniform and continuous, whereas when the hemp was not there, then the Canada thistle at this height, it's already started flowering. So kind of interesting observation that we made this year. Next one. Then I'd like to talk about the, uh, that's about the grain hemp and uh, we are doing the harvest and I guess in about three weeks time, we would have the data ready, uh, with which we would be posting on our website. And then we are also a part of the CBD hemp varietal trial along with Shelby. This is a Midwest collaboration effort. Uh, Michael Fields is an organic production system. Uh, so CBD is grown organically. Uh, 44 varieties, the same like 26 varieties as transplants, uh, 6, 14 clones, and four auto varieties. Uh, we could see a difference, like uh, Shelby uh, said that most of our 50% flowering was on the week of 10th August, but mine is, uh, I have observed as the 24th August. I would essentially think this difference is because of the variation in our observations. This is, we constantly have meetings, and uh, this is what we are discussing, and how do we actually nail it? This and the constantly the constant thing is that each of us are doing it, so it's a slightly vari uh, variable, but it's almost around the 15 to 20 in within that 15 day period between the 10th and the 24th of August. And we are doing also the CBD analysis, the third, fifth, and the seventh week of flowering, thanks to Rock to the labs who are doing the analysis with all the varieties. Next one. Okay, so uh, this is something that we observed in. Uh, uh, Hemp. We did a cover cropping so as to reduce the wheat competition. And so first uh, we planted rye and uh, clover. Uh, you could see how the rows are germinating and then uh, it was pretty thick. Uh, the whole area was covered. Next one, please. Next one. Okay, so this is how uh, we raised the seedlings. This is our seedlings and then we planted into a place where it was filled. It was fully covered with rye, uh, the rows of rye and clover. Clover didn't take off so much, but the rye, rye had grown. And you can see the seedlings that are transplanted into this dense place. We just took out holes and then we planted the seedlings. Next one, please. So this is how it looked like the clover and the rye row. And then we had to plant it where it was fully covered. Uh, the other area was covered by vegetation. This is in order to reduce the weed growth. But what we found was that this was not a good method because the, the plants just sat and sat and sat. The first four weeks, they never grew. And so then uh, we had to really work on it in, uh, to help it to grow. This is uh, one thing was that we gave a root bound because was, the soil was not loose and they couldn't spread out and grow. And so I would think that this method um, of growing in order to reduce weeds and organic farming systems at least we have to strip till before you go in for planting. If you plant into cover crops, then it, there's a fierce competition with the uh, organic, uh, the hemp plants, and it's not able to grow. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is how it was. It just sat for a long time. This is four weeks after planting because the date of planting was 15th of June. It didn't, it didn't grow at all. And so it, it was turning yellow and we did a manure, uh, composted chicken manure application, right? Removing the, uh, the cow crop around the root zone and then applying uh, the chicken, pellet to chicken manure. And then you could see within a week, the change in color. And then within another week, it was fully branching and growing well. So this is one observation that we have made that dry is not a good, uh, plan to grow, with, which uh, not a good cover crop when you want to go in for hemp. Next one, please. Next one, please. Next, yeah. So this is just an overview now. This is how the plants look. So it was it the, it just took off after the application of manure, and then you can see that we regularly I go ahead and keep mowing the um, cover crop so as to not have great competition now it's all dying back and then you can see the cover uh, the clover just existing now 
Next one, please. That's more from me here. This is just was a thank you slide. Probably if you tap it again, it's going to come up. So uh, it is animated so probably. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, this is this is just I just wanted to share um, my experiences for the drawings. Any questions? We will take at the end of everybody's presentation. Thank you all. All right, thank you. <laughs> Our next update is from Marguerite Bolt from Purdue University. So welcome, Marguerite. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm gonna mostly focus on some of the problems we've seen this year. Um, we have multiple research projects going on. One of them is a large USDA organic research uh, initiative with Rodale Institute, but there are a handful of graduate students working on that and I haven't seen any of their preliminary data yet since this is the first field season. Um, so I'm just gonna focus on what I've dealt with with our growers since my position is 100% extension. There we go. Um, so a couple of key observations for Indiana, and this really um, mirrors what uh, the economics discussion went over. We are seeing a lot more licenses this year, but reduced acreage than what we expected. Um, part of this is due to COVID. So there are a lot of people who intended to plant more um, because they grew last year and it was successful. Um, they wanted to scale up but there were delays in both propagation um, from different greenhouses and there are also delays in shipping. So we saw some scaling back of actual acreage while keeping um, a lot of growers in the game. And then we saw a lot of late planting. Um, this was due mainly to new growers not exactly knowing what was going on. We saw a lot of mid to end July plantings. Um, so I just have a couple photos uh, to demonstrate the difference we saw. So uh, we had a mid-July planting. This is up in northern Indiana. Um, so we do have a difference in our climate regions. And then we had a mid-June planting in Tippecanoe County, which is in the central part of the state. But the, the plant size is drastically different. And I've seen this across the state, regardless of what region they're growing. These really late planted crops are flowering at the same time as the early planted crops, right? Because it's a, a photo period dependent plant. Um, but the size is just drastically reduced for those light planting. So they're gonna see a reduction in yield. Um, we have a lot of growers trying new varieties uh, that has come at an expense to them, however. Um, so there are a lot more varieties available this year. Uh, however, not all of those are reliable. Um, so our state chemist is starting to send out a lot of destruction reports within the last week. Um, I haven't seen the specific varieties that are um, consistently hot at this point. I haven't gotten a list from our state chemist, um, but growers are still seeing issues when it comes to that. Um, there are also a handful of growers who unfortunately um, worked with a company that sold them what they claimed to, to be as feminized seed, but were actually just standard dioecious hemp seed. So they're paying, you know, a dollar per seed plus an extra 75 cents for a greenhouse to pop those for them. Um, and they were purchasing just regular hemp seed. So about 50 to 60% male. So that's been an issue for some of our growers this year. Um, so I have a background in entomology. So I'm gonna talk about some of the key pests we've seen. Um, some of those are the same as University of Wisconsin. Uh, some are different. So in the top left photo, we have a common stock borer. So what was kind of funny about this one is I haven't observed it in hemp. It is recorded as a pest of hemp in the McPartland Pest and Disease book um, that came out in, I think, 2000. Um, but this pest was also a problem in Iowa. So what happened was growers were trying to manage weeds uh, around the perimeter of their field. Uh, this pest happened to be residing in those weeds. And when they cut those plants down or sprayed them with an herbicide, all those caterpillars moved within their hemp crop um, and caused about 12 to 18 inches worth of uh, damage within the stock. So that was a problem for some of our growers due to um, weed management later in the season. But we also see potato leaf hopper, um, which I know James Dedecker found up in the Upper Peninsula. Um, we saw this pest last year. It was pretty isolated uh, to one field that was right next to alfalfa um, and it was organically managed. But this year, um, within the last three weeks, I've seen a lot more potato leaf hopper damage. Um, and it's been pretty uh, consistent among two varieties, one that's called Wu5 and another one called Midwestern Strain, which is the same, strain, same variety I saw damage in last year. Um, and then 
we have um, Eurasian hemp borer, which Shelby mentioned. We have this in Indiana as well. Um, you look for rotting at the top of the, the flower, and then if you pop that open, you oftentimes will find this um, little larva there. And I don't have any photos of corn earworm, um, just because I started getting emails today and yesterday about this pest. Um, so corn earworm is a huge problem in Indiana, um, not just for sweet corn and field corn, um, but also for hemp. So we tend to see damage um, September to October once corn is, sweet corn is either harvested or field corn is um, well past the silking stage, we see hemp is a really attractive host for this pest. Um, and this is true in a lot of other states. There have been reports of thousands of dollars worth of damage um, due to corn earworm alone. So that's just something for, for growers, especially in um, you know Southern Michigan, Illinois, uh, Indiana, we see a lot of corn earworm damage. Um, so just be aware of that. And we do have products um, registered through EPA for, for, however, they don't work when you have big, fat, you know, two inch caterpillars in your flowers. And then lastly, I want to talk about pathogens because we've just had a huge surge in pathogen problems within the last couple of weeks. Um, we've seen a lot of FOMA leaf spot, which is in that top left corner. Um, and that's from our research farm south of campus. So that's where we've seen the most FOMA. Um, and each year it gets worse and worse. And this year was, um, you know, every single plant we observed had a uh, FOMA leaf spot. Also in the bottom, we have um, Dreschlera or hemp leaf spot. This is a problem um, that has been identified in Kentucky and they see it pretty widely distributed across their state. Um, we're also finding it in Indiana. We're not sure about yield loss at this point. Um, we have a lot of powdery mildew right now. We had some really cool kind of damp conditions within the last couple of weeks. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of powdery mildew pop up, which we haven't um, struggled with in previous years. So this year, it just seems like conditions were right. And then the bottom photo is what I think is downy mildew. Um, we haven't sent that sample into the lab yet, but we did get a positive report for the first time of downy mildew in Indiana. And we saw those cooler kind of damp conditions that led to, to more mildews popping up. Um, so that's kind of the update I have for problems growers are seeing. Weed management is always an issue for hemp growers um, with the lack of herbicides and, and defined management techniques. Um, but that's the, the update I have. And if, I have if you have questions, I'll take them at the end of this Midwest segment. All right, thank you. So last uh, and final Midwest regional update is coming from James Dedecker from Matt, uh, Michigan State University. And then once he's done, we're just going to bring up his um, presentation quick and then James can take it away. Uh, we will stay on to answer questions. Uh, again, we appreciate everybody being on our meeting today. And with that, I will have Dr. James take it away. Hello from Michigan, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. I'm actually out at one of our research locations today, but the wind is whipping, uh, so I felt like I probably shouldn't stand in the field. Um, but uh, I'm James C. Decker. I'm the director of the MSU Upper Peninsula Research and Extension Center. And today I'm going to talk about one of our hemp projects uh, called the Hemp Tribal Research Initiative for Michigan, or Hemp Trim. Next slide, please. Or maybe I have rights. If you want to ask for to control it, James, you can uh, do that up above in the remote control section there. I don't know if you have that with you. It'll be up on the top part of the screen on the right. It says remote control. You can ask for access. Otherwise, if you want me to advance them, I can. Okay, if you don't mind, that would be sure. helpful. That's fine. Um, looks like we have some formatting issues, so bear with me. Um, looks like we went to widescreen. Um, this is just an overview that I'm going to, uh, things I'm going to touch on today. We'll start with a look at the project funding and partners, and then I'll talk a little bit about our objectives with this project um, that make it a little bit unique in the hemp world right now. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the research that we're conducting and some of the things we've seen this year. Not really results per se, but more um, in-season updates like we just heard from Marguerite. Next slide, please. 
Well, this is a project uh, funded through NIFA, and it's a NIFA tribal research grant. And the objective of that program is to build research capacity at tribal institutions around the country. Um, we have partnered with Bay Mills Community College and Weishby Bay Farm. That's where I'm at today in Brimley, Michigan. Um, and we are the co-PIs on the project. And then we're also working with the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians and their tribal farm called Ziba Mijuang Farm, as well as, of course, the Michigan State University and Extension and uh, Lake Superior State University, their cannabis chemistry program and Dr. Ben Southwell is doing uh, the analysis for this project. So we also have uh, another uh, university partner here in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I won't uh, read off these objectives, but just to give you a sense of what we're up to, um, the main thing that we're doing this year is variety testing at uh, different locations that I'll show you in a minute. And we are doing variety trials for both uh, grain and fiber in a combined system and CBD separately. Um, I heard a question earlier about pollination and we ran into um, that concern last year. But uh, as was stated in response to that question, we've seen an offset in uh, flowering timing between grain and fiber and CBD at our Northern latitude. So it's worked out pretty well to do that research um, with fairly close proximity at some of our locations. Um, we're also evaluating uh, our variety plots for pests and pathogens. And uh, next year we'll be getting into more of the weed control work. It's interesting to see uh, what Esther shared. We're gonna be looking at uh, different methods of cultivation, synthetic mulch, cover crops, um, like the living mulch as weed control tools in uh, hemp systems here. And then uh, I mentioned working with the Lake Superior State to try to an analyze the quality of the flower and cannabinoid content and contamination. We're also looking at grain quality, uh, both protein and oil in the grain coming from our, our uh, grain and fiber variety. And then finally, uh, we're doing some outreach that's focused specifically on tribal communities in Michigan, trying to use a discussion approach to understand uh, their needs and priorities and questions related to this crop and how our research can best affect those. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a four-year project. So you can see we're starting with variety trials and then we'll be moving into some of the other components in uh, subsequent years. Next slide, please. This uh, is to give you a sense of the locations where we're working. So our facility is uh, the top uh, Spartan helmet there located in Alger County in the central UP. Um, we also, uh, we did separate our grain and fiber and CBD trials at the MSU locations this year. So our grain and fiber is down in the Escanaba area. That's that lower uh, Spartan helmet. Then Weishiki Bay Farm, where I'm at today, is over in Chippewa County in the eastern upper peninsula by that turtle symbol. And then in the northwest lower peninsula, just below the Mackinac Bridge, is Ziba Mijuang Farm. Um, in our grain and fiber trials, we've got 14 varieties at these three locations. And then in our CBD trials, we have 36 varieties at uh, UPREC at our North Farm facility. And that includes the 16 varieties as part of this hate project, plus an additional 20 in collaboration with Shelby and uh, Esther at UW Microscope. Next slide, please. Just some pictures to give you a sense of what our CBD trials look like, uh, much like some of the photos that we've seen already today. Um, from early season in the top left towards uh, mid flowering and our auto flowering varieties at bottom right. Next slide, please. And these are uh, photos as an example of our grain and fiber trials. So you can see obvious differences in the production systems that we've heard about. Uh, these are direct seeded seven inch rows, uh, higher populations in grain and fiber compared to the transplant system or horticultural model that we're using in uh, CBD. I'm glad that someone mentioned though the, the novel CBD production. We are also testing some varieties uh, that are intended for grain and CBD in this uh, agronomic system that we have for our grain and fiber trial. Next slide, please. Um, just to give you a sense of some of the things that we've run into this year, um, we have seen European corn borer damage, uh, both in grain and CBD plots uh, at different locations in northern Michigan. Um, in the grain and fiber, we did have a uh, loss because they were single stem plants. They pretty much died from the entry point to that boring hole uh, upward. The picture on the top 
top uh, right there is uh, where the, the stalk was bored into, or not the stalk, but actually the, the flower was bored into. So you can see the dead flower on top and the live flower from the below. Um, some cases, though, they went in lowering the plant and actually killed the whole plant. Um, in the CBD, we haven't really seen a lot of extensive damage. We saw a lot of uh, larvae and boreholes and frass, but not uh, loss of plants, except uh, in the case at the top left, where it seemed that in some cases where we had damage from corn borer and CBD, we had more uh, white mold coming in later. So I suspect that uh, perhaps that plant injury might have contributed or created a route of entry for white mold. And that has caused some lodging um, in those plants that are severely infected. We've also had cannabis aphid for the second year in our CBD uh, plants at different locations. And uh, one of the challenges that we're facing, this is the first year working with CBD, is just all of the harvest and post-harvest issues um, and the, the differences in that system, learning about how to dry, buck, yeah. here, uh, trim that material. Next slide, please. We've seen uh, quite a bit of bird damage in our grain and fiber plots at certain locations this year. Um, so that certainly uh, has been challenging and caused us to actually harvest uh, one location a little bit early to try to uh, avoid as much of that damage as possible. And then as Marguerite mentioned, and uh, it seemed to be variety specific or, or um, certainly not every plant in our trial had the same amount of pressure. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if that really has many implications for yield or anything like that. For the most part, it doesn't seem like um, it's really causing economic damage for us. Next slide, please. Um, if there's anyone interested specifically in the issue of hemp or cannabis generally in tribal communities, there are a number of resources targeting tribal communities. Um, this is a unique issue in terms of uh, sovereignty of tribal nations because tribes are charged like states by USDA at uh, coming up with, uh, submitting, and managing their own regulatory process for hemp. So uh, the two tribes that we're working at may have fairly different policy uh, from the state of Michigan, and they have the, the sovereignty to be able to do that as long as that plan is approved by USDA and they can manage to administer it. So pretty interesting uh, issue in terms of uh, agriculture and food sovereignty for, for Michigan tribes or, or tribes across the U.S. Really. Uh, I think the next slide is just uh, inviting questions. So thank you for the time today and thanks for the invite, uh, Shelby, and happy to stick around for a Q&A. All right, thank you, James. So um, we do have some questions that I would like to get to you. We are uh, approaching close to time. So I do understand if people uh, need to log off, but I'm going to go through what we have our speakers on and ask questions. And again, we will be sending uh, the recording out at some point to everyone who registered. And we will also be sending an evaluation along with that if, if those participants would fill that out along with a sheet with all the contact information and different links that we have shared today. I know people have been asking for those. So we will compile that all into a nice sheet for everyone and send out along with our eval and um, the recording. So with that, um, I since I have everybody on here, I'm going to go um, with what we have our Midwestern region update. There was a question for Phil from Illinois with the database. Are there plans to scale this database nationally or internationally? Um, we are still kind of in the middle uh, of it, you know, right this year, but we would like to expand this to other states um, if we can find a good way to do it moving forward. There's a lot of um, interesting things we're kind of dealing with right now with differences among the labs and how uh, interpretations of uh, compliance are, but we would certainly like to expand this program moving forward, but um, it's going to take a team effort and, and we would like to maybe even expand this to different states with um, state approved labs being on board to contribute to this. So we certainly would like to do this moving forward, increasing the scope um, and the scale of the project and we're, we're looking for uh, suggestions and comments, but yeah, absolutely. We'd like to keep this moving, moving forward. All right, thank you. 
The next question would be for Esther with the cover crops. Um, if you are not, um, if rye is not recommended for a cover crop, what would you recommend? I'm sorry. <laughs> so last year uh, we did rye and clover, but after planting the hemp and we broadcast that, and so it was pretty good. The rye had already established by then, uh, but I'm sorry, the hemp had already established and by the time rye was growing up, and so it was a good weed control after, uh, if you plant it after repeated, but if you establish rye in the beginning and then plant hemp into it, then there's a fierce competition. So that is something that we thought. But next year we're planning to go with just clover and see how it's going to work out. We haven't had any other experimentation with other cover crops. So maybe next year we'll be able to give more, a better answer to that question. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to just go back up here a second to some of the other questions that have come in and um, This might be um, for Shelby or Haley uh, or even Jerry, if you're able. Um, are we using any other nutrients like potassium or phosphorus in our fertilizer besides nitrogen? Um, I could take a quick crack at that one. I think, you know, soil testing is always going to be number one. Um, a lot of these fields, you know, that might be some alternative fields that people have used or they've been fallow for a number of years. So I think soil testing is number one, but just in general across Western Wisconsin, anyway, we've seen potassium levels low um, just in general agricultural fields. So that's number one is get, is get testing. As far as actual research um, we've just been looking at nitrogen uh, from the Chippewa County side of things. And Haley can maybe comment if they're, delving deeper into other nutrients. But I know soil test is number one. We've been preaching that for years. Get that done. And then, um, you know, we'll have some recommendations that'll, that'll come along with that. Yeah, to echo what Jerry said, we are only looking at nitrogen, but we did take um, soil tests between the two sites on both years. And we did notice that the triple fault site had lower levels of some of those routine nutrients that you might adjust for um, specifically with phosphorus and potassium. So that would be something that you would want to look at and see where your fields are at to see if they are well below other critical levels. Um, but we are only in the terms of a specific research project looking at um, nitrogen from the grain and fiber standpoint. And just one other thing to add to that is the, the most common micronutrient deficiency that I've observed in the essential oil crops tends to be sulfur. So that's, um, again, we're not, I'm not specifically doing any research in that right now, but that's something that pops up time and time again for deficiencies. All right, thank you. Um, and while I have both uh, Shelby and Haley on, and maybe Haley, you could go first. And if and 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 if you can answer, otherwise this may be for part of the economic section. Um, are there any information on the fiber and grain marketplaces specifically for here in Wisconsin? Do we know of certain buyers or processes? Are they at capacity? Are they looking for more producers? And um, that goes along with for fiber and grain. If maybe Haley could answer, and then also that question has come up on the. CBD and as well for Shelby. Yeah, so right now I am not aware of any fiber processing or grain processing in the state of Wisconsin. Um, for grain, you have a little bit more opportunity specifically with certain companies that may be contracting out for grain to go into um, kind of that oil extraction from the grain. Um, for the fiber, there's really not a lot of options anywhere. Um, there was a processing plant in Kentucky at one point it was running and then it wasn't. Um, I'm not sure where the actual standpoint of, of that processor is right now, um, but markets is a pretty significant limiting factor um, for the, the grain and fiber.
Yes, and, and that's what I've heard as well. I think with the fiber, there's, I mean, both with fiber and grain, there's a lot of excitement, but the, the infrastructure for dealing with those products, particularly the fiber, is, is very intensive. And it's not just um, even the redding process, but then there's so many different potential products that all have different specifications. So it's really figuring out, I think, what those industries are going to be and what their specifications will be for the products that are needed. Um, I know there are lots of people that are very interested in putting money into this. So I, you know, I hope that the, the way that it's approached is just figuring out how to grow the crop on smaller acreage and, and doing it well and better understanding of the rutting process. The same with the grain for making sure it comes off the field and it's dry quickly so you don't have any microbial um, problems because that's, I think, very, very common that people grow it and then the same with the CBD. Once it's you're ready to harvest, there's this huge bottleneck. You have to have a place to dry it. You have to have a place to store it. Um, with the CBD, I think the people that I've seen that have been most successful in the industry so far have access to direct buyers. So right now there are people who will process material, but they will either take a split and take part of the, um, the oil that they extracted, or you have to pay them to process it. So it, it, if you have any way to get into a store or do online direct sales, I think that that's one of the only parts of the CBD industry that is increasing right now is direct to consumer online sales because of COVID. Um, but really, if there's a way that you can um, do it yourself or where you get your oil processed, you have a way to sell it at farmers markets or direct to consumers is the best way to be profitable with it. Um, so in the meantime, we just have to figure out how to make the process less expensive. Um, so there is a better margin for the producers. Shelby, if I could follow up on the grain side, um, I do think because of the similarities with other commodity grain or oil production that uh, capacity for handling and processing and markets for grain hemp will emerge rather rapidly, maybe more so than, uh, than the CBD and cannabinoid industry. Um, however, right now we're seeing growers in Michigan that are doing the same thing that we saw CBD producers doing last year, which is vertically integrating and figuring out how to process and market their own crops, like Shelby was just saying on the CBD side. So for example, there's a couple that are growing grain hemp for the first time in, uh, in the catering industry. And so they have a commercial kitchen space and they're experimenting with how to process that seed and create a protein bars or other protein supplement products, food products with that grain. Um, other people are doing cold pressed hemp oil. Um, I know of a grower that has, uh, is now selling uh, oil that he's, he's pressed from the grain. So uh, um, probably not what we'll see long term, but there are folks that are taking that approach short term with grain as well. All right, thank you. Um, one of the next questions, um, and I'm just gonna keep going through, we have a few more left if that's okay with everyone. Um, and this could be for anybody. Will you be looking at THC concentrations in plants that are allowed to mature past optimum harvest time? I've seen studies that suggest THC percent, percent goes down if the plants are left in the field past their traditional harvest time. So um, the trial that we're running, that was kind of the thought process behind taking the three, five, and seven weeks is knowing what we know about the current status of cultivars that are being grown for cannabinoid production. Um, that seven week is going to be hot for the majority of samples, and it is going to be pushing it for some of those later flowering varieties into kind of less ideal uh, weather. Um, Beyond when it snows, we're not going to be able to have plants in the field still to kind of like test it, at least for this trial. But one thing that I did last year and I plan on doing this year is after harvesting it and, and bucking it so I have biomass coming back maybe after six months in storage to see what has happened to that cannabinoid profile. I'm very interested, even if I were to try a few different treatments under ideal storage conditions or kind of rather harsh conditions with either high, um, high light or uh, too hot or too, I don't think it get too cold, but um, just seeing how storage conditions influence that profile. Uh, 
that's that's one thing I hope to do this fall and winter. And and I and I do know from last year taking a few data points after harvest in storage for a few months that there was a small uh, decrease in that cannabinoid content, but that's well after it's been out of the field. And another question, um, how did you take samples for the cannabinoid potency? Was it just your best flowers or which ones did you use? Bill, do you wanna answer that one since you designed the protocol? <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that question? I... Uh, the question was, how did you take your samples for can cannabinoid potency? Did you use just your best flowers or other flowers? So the protocol itself um, was kind of a combination of things here. So we, we really followed mostly the procedures that are followed by Wisconsin and Indiana and pretty similar to Michigan, where it took the top three inches um, of, a, of a cola, provided that it's in the top one third overall plant height. And that comes from the USDA uh, sampling guidelines. And since we're trying to find a way to really keep us all in the same playing field, we wanted to find a way that fit each state's rules or uh, guidelines, but also allowed us to, to work together uh, to, to figure this out. So um, I'd be glad to send the protocol and it's actually available on our database. There's a whole grower protocol of what we did, uh, but Five plants were selected in the field and they were, were supposed to be marked so we could continue to sample from the same plant. Um, and then from those five plants, we took uh, three samples from each plant or kind of vice versa, right? So we wanted to make sure we had 15 sample plants from the top one third of the plant that was being sampled, uh, plants that were being sampled. And we try, we're hoping uh, that by keeping the protocol in place and then also having the same lab on board that we're able to really make sure that these samples are being collected in the same way or as close to as we can. All right, thank you, Phil. There's a few questions, uh, some comments going on in the chat. I'm just going to go double check that I've answered all the questions here through our YouTube stream. And then um, we will wrap this up here for the day and be finished. And like I said, we will get this recording out to you. Um, one of the other questions that is on here, are there any suggestions for CBD drying after harvest? Um, in the chat box, so James, you answered that correctly. Um, so the, it, it really comes down to um, the size of your acreage. Um, so, you know, if you're working with small scale acreage, that you have a drying facility that can accommodate that. A lot of people, you know, are just using barns with fans and dehumidifiers or any sort of indoor structure where you can drop the humidity below hopefully 60% down to 50% and keep it. Um, you know, you don't you don't want to promote any sort of pathogen growth. So you want to avoid really damp. Um, cold environments. So if you have a drying facility, a lot of people are just cutting off their prime branches or, or hanging that whole plant to dry. There are also large drying facilities that are available. There's several in Wisconsin. I think there's some on the call right now that they will help you dry that material. They'll actually chop that material, run it through dryers. That's if you have really large scale and you need a, you don't necessarily have the place to do that on your own. Um, that's going to lower your CBD percentage, but you're also going to have a lot more pound per acre if you're if you're chopping that whole plant um and they're also you know in the future there's going to be ways where you might be able to further um separate that plant parts into different you know floral material versus stock material versus grain material so you could get different um different products out of the end of processing it but um really it comes down to what you have access to and how much time you have <laughs> All right, thanks, Shelby. All right, I have two more questions and then we will make sure we wrap this up here by 1.15 and I will put them together. Uh, one was maybe more of a comment, but then the other is a question. Could you just quickly explain, Shelby, the difference uh, between being licensed and registered as a grower? And then have you heard of the Garden of Eden method? 
<laughs> that might be the fun one that came through the um the other chat so um so so with licensing and registration um so that's handled through DACAP in Wisconsin but pretty much there's a one-time um a one-time license fee that you pay to be able to grow hemp in Wisconsin and then you have to register year after year if you want to grow in that particular year so that's the difference with that um I'm not sure how that will change under the new 2018 um, federal guidelines, and we're not exactly sure. Wisconsin is working on their plan right now. It hasn't been submitted yet. Um, I'll, I have not heard of the Garden of Eating, I don't think, but the one other thing in the comments that I wanted to see um, or just mention is people were talking about reputable businesses to buy seed from and local businesses, and I'll just mention that you know, these, these cultivar trials that we're running, that's really the goal of that is to see we're getting seed from all over, you know, it might perform wonderfully in one place, but we're, we want to see how it performs here locally so we can make the best recommendations of people that seem to be selling really reliable, high quality products for, for all types of hemp. So, so stay tuned for those results. Um, and we hope to continue doing those types of studies so we can make the best recommendations to the growers. Um, but now let's talk about that Garden of Eden. <laughs> yeah, back to Eden, it said. Oh, back to Eden? Yeah, have you seen a lot oh. of people using the back to Eden gardening method? Does anyone else have any comments on that? I, I, I'll look it up. <laughs> All right, well, with that, um, I don't have any more questions. There's been some chat going on. If for some reason we did miss one of your questions today, again, we will be sending out all of the speakers with their links that uh, and emails. You can send them messages or send any of us here at extension messages and um, be looking for that in your inboxes for those of you who registered in the next week or so. And please take time to fill out the evaluation as well. So again, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today and um, stay tuned for more hemp updates. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Well, I think that went pretty well. I see most people are still dropping off, but um, like I said, I think uh, we have most of the contact information from the presentations. Does it, do any of the speakers have an issue with us having those in uh, PDF form? And then we can make them as part of the package that goes out? No issue at all. Okay, thanks, Phil. For me. Okay. I think all my slides have not for publishing on them. So. Okay. Yeah, same. So the next step is to sit tight one second here. We'll just sit tight a minute as we um, finish. Yeah. And then yeah, we'll... I was just trying to catch the speakers before they went off. Yeah, yeah. If, yep, yep. if we have that. any quick questions for the speakers, and then yeah, we won't include your stuff, Haley. Or we could just set, we could put, yeah, we'll, we'll figure out how we send this out. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I included it on my slides, but it's.